I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime, and this is Currents. History in the making as Los Angeles welcomes its future Archbishop. Rocco Palmo will have the latest. Some amazing stories in one documentary. The director of The Calling is here to talk about it. What they were saying and projecting out into the world was that life is a calling. And another documentary examines the life and legacy of the world's best known priest on TV. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Around 4,000 people packed the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels in Los Angeles to welcome the man who will take over as Archbishop next year. Archbishop Jose Gomez was greeted with kind words by the man he'll succeed, Cardinal Roger Mahoney. Be assured of our prayers and support as you join me in continuing the work of the gospel. The Archdiocese of Los Angeles is the largest in the U.S. with five million Catholics, three quarters of them Hispanic. Archbishop Gomez is now expected to, uh, to become the first Hispanic American Cardinal. Well, Currents contributor Rocco Palmo is the author of Whispers in the Loja, the blog online. He's uh, been to Los Angeles. He's been there actually covering the events for his blog, and now he's here to join us from L.A. with more. Hey, Rocco. LA, Matt and Francesca. How are you? <laughs> How you doing? Out in sunny California. Well, uh, it's actually we... raining right now. Oh, well, <laughs> see, I'm, I'm... So much for the weather. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and it was, you know, 90 degrees here yesterday, so there you go. We're like switching places all of a sudden. You took the yeah, weather with you. Yeah, we're in the you. 60s out here. I'm, I'm like, where's this California weather? I've heard right. so much about. That's pretty hot. Well, there was uh, a lot of goodwill, I understand, and uh, a lot of beauty inside today in the cathedral here. Tell me a little bit about your experience uh, today with this Mass, or yesterday with this Mass. Well, uh, Matt, uh, I, I said to my readers that... Um, uh, it was the most emotional, powerful, impressive liturgy I've ever seen, by far. And I've seen 80 installations, five people masses, any kind of mass, you know, in any setting you can think of. But the L.A. Church has become famous for this style of worship that's reverent but very contemporary, very emotional, accessible to people. And in using nine or ten languages at yesterday's Mass and all different kinds of musical styles, they pulled out all the stops, 120 voice choir. Mm. And it was just, um, you know, a, a reporter who sat next to me in the press box actually had the best line. She said, I feel like I'm at the opening ceremony of the Olympics. <laughs> it felt like something either between that, a movie, um, just uh, it lived up to its billing as the show of the century. And, and Rocco, obviously, um, you're, you've been following this story for a long time. Actually being there in L.A., you've alluded to the fact that it was very much a, a production. Talk to us a little bit about how they dealt with those 4,000 people that were there, seven cardinals, 59 bishops, 411 priests. That's a lot of people there to celebrate. Yeah, well, uh, it's amazing because, you know, this is the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels was just opened in 2002, so this is Cardinal Mahoney's been the Archbishop for 25 years. So Archbishop Gomez is the first Archbishop to be welcomed in the new cathedral. Um, it, it doesn't feel like there are 4,000 people in there. It's a very, once you're inside, it's a very intimate space. And uh, the procession took about a half hour, but they have a big plaza outside so everybody could gather before and afterward. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people obviously... It was ticket only, uh, and even most of the deacons of the archdiocese weren't given tickets. A lot of the religious priests here were also left off the invitation list. So it was a really, they said it was the toughest ticket to get in, you know, the last 40 years here. Mm -hmm. But outside, there were, uh, the thing that moved me most, uh, in the street, there were 400 members of a, a new movement called the Neocatechumenal Way. Around 40 of them had guitars and drums, and they were just <laughs> singing these chants for 45 minutes before the Mass, and it felt like the walls were shaking. It was just, a, it added to the, the beauty, the richness, the, the history of the moment. It was really stunning. Wow. Well, then back inside, I understand, that, of course, there were some very moving moments to you. You had expressed a move, uh, a mo uh, for, uh, um, emotions rather over a moment when uh, I believe Cardinal Mahoney offered the chair to Archbishop Gomez. Tell me a little about that. Well, at the end of the Mass, you know, because the, when a coadjutor comes, you know, a bishop not, who's not immediately the diocesan bishop, but will become the bishop shortly, 
there's it's a very short ceremony it's a legal ceremony it's not really a, um, it's not like the installation of a bishop when he's led to his chair so Cardinal Mahoney said at the end of the mass I was thinking of you know trying to find something to make it a little bit more um, rich uh, he said but the liturgy books didn't help me uh, but he, he said that he found one line that said that the chair should be fitting to the bishop. He said, well, let's see if Archbishop Gomez fits in the chair. <laughs> so he, and, and literally, he said, I invite Archbishop Gomez to take the chair. He didn't tell Gomez in advance about this, because uh, the cardinal said after the Mass, if I had told him he was going to, uh, I was going to do this, he would have told, he would have begged me not to. <laughs> and so he's a very humble man, but then he brought Archbishop Gomez over to the chair, and the crowd leapt to its feet, and literally you could hear people cheering and whooping it up, and, and that was a beautiful, that was a, a, a great moment at the end. But even before that, the presentation of the gifts, and this is really relevant for Brooklyn being such a multicultural diocese, mm-hmm. too. You had around 40 members of different ethnic groups here in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles bring cloths from their ethnic traditions to dress the altar. Hmm. And it was, they all processed up, and then the altar cloths and the purificator was placed over it for the liturgy of the Eucharist. But uh, there was a Latin hymn being sung mixed in with the Vietnamese hymn sung by four boat women who had come over. In, in Vietnamese, it was, and, and I, I, my, my eyes started welling up at seeing this. And even the staff, the, the folks here who are used to this kind of liturgy, they said that moment just for them took the cake, that and the archbishop in the chair. Wow, well, you know, it's been said that there's 42 different languages that are spoken in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and also noted that there were 288 representatives, one from each parish in the Los Angeles Diocese that was there yesterday as well, really signifying the diversity. And we know that Archbishop Gomez is from Monterey, Mexico, and he spoke a little bit about immigration as well yesterday. What was your take on that? Well, it was interesting because, you know, actually there were three representatives from each parish, so that was around, there were around 800 people from the parishes. But uh, the archbishop said no one is, you know, he didn't say the word immigration, but he said no one is an alien in the eyes of God. And the congregation spontaneously applauded, and he said it in English and in Spanish. But even beyond, I mean, immigration was just one part of his emphasis on the dignity of the human person, from the unborn, the aged, the infirm, uh, the disabled, uh, but, you know, the migrant. But also, I mean, one thing that really won the priests over, which was very special, was when he talked about the priesthood being the joy of his life, and he started crying. And then he spoke about his family and got emotional then. His parents are both deceased, but his sisters, uh, his four sisters were there. He's the only boy. And, and, and uh, for, especially for a place that's so predominantly Latino with great emphasis on family life, that moved folks. And, and they were saying afterward, he spoke to us as if he was in the family now. Mm-hmm. And, and so there were, you know, uh, this is the first time really the L.A. folks have gotten to see him, um, you know, uh, without the filter of TV or, right. or you know, clip edited statements. And, and and people were genuinely who had been people who had been maybe a little skeptical about the archbishop before he arrived were genuinely warmed and I saw a priest afterward and only in California could somebody say this I said what do you think and he said uh, bright days ahead we're moving forward baby and and so that was really <laughs> <All right. laughs> only in L A right <laughs> there there you go all right well Rocco Palmo thank you so much for being here once again we appreciate your time and thanks for giving us your perspective on uh, how things went we appreciate it. Anytime, Matt and Francesca. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Thanks, Rocco. And Rocco has written much more about this on his blog, Whispers in the Loggia. We've actually posted a link on our blog where you can read it all. Just go to CurrentsNY.net and check out our blog called Writing the Way. Well, stay tuned. There's much more current straight ahead. When we return, we'll have the day's headlines, including the Bishop of Phoenix getting words of support from all around the world. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Coming up just a bit later, a world-famous Catholic priest could soon be a saint. We'll look back at his life. But first, let's check today's headlines. Amid deadly violence in the city of Kingston, a Jamaican archbishop tried to calm fears during an interview with Vatican Radio on Wednesday. Jamaican police tried to arrest a local drug lord Monday. The police raids resulted in street battles that have lasted for days now. Police say as many as 50 people have been killed in the violence so far. Kingston Archbishop Donald James Reese told Vatican Radio that most of the country is calm, but he said well-paid gunmen would continue to do battle with police. 
Archbishop Reese said he asked all priests and religious to pray the St. Michael the Archangel prayer. Well, Catholic leaders from around the globe stepped up this week in defense of an Arizona bishop who publicly criticized an abortion that took place at a Catholic hospital. Last week, Phoenix Bishop Thomas Olmsted condemned the abortion, saying all Catholics who took part were automatically excommunicated. Well, this week, 71 prominent Catholic leaders signed a joint statement supporting the bishop's position. The statement said, quote, We stand in solidarity with Bishop Olmsted in his defense of truth and life, and we also offer our prayers for those involved with the abortion. Now, a hospital ethics committee determined that the abortion was the only way to save the mother's life. Pregnancy is also at the center of a controversy over a high school yearbook in Texas. Alongside the talk of cheerleaders and band practice, the book features articles about sex, drug use, and drinking. As we hear from Quita Culpepper, the parents are upset, but many students say they don't see what all the fuss is about. It's your typical high school yearbook with smiling pictures of the junior and senior class, the Pflugerville High School football team, and the theater department. But one section is causing more drama than yearbook staff bargained for. With a poll on how students feel about sex, nicknames for illegal drugs, and how many kids drink on a regular basis. One page is devoted to teen pregnancy. It highlights an expecting high school couple and their fears for the future. It also features a sonogram of their baby. I suppose the parents are kind of getting at that it's encouraging sex before marriage or something, or teenage sex, but it's really not. Many Pflugerville High School students say these issues aren't new to kids their age. Yeah, these kids actually took responsibility for their actions. Put that in the yearbook and encourage people to be responsible. You can go around thinking teenagers don't know about this, but that's not the truth. And I mean, if a teenager doesn't know about this, then that means they live an extremely sheltered life. The yearbook came out on Monday, and since then, the district says it's received a handful of phone calls and emails about the contents. The district says it's surprised that there's a controversy. Pflugerville ISD released this statement that reads in part, The Pflugerville High School Yearbook is a publication written by students for students and reflects the issues and trends at PHS in a given year. Content is approved by a faculty advisor and, in this case, by the principal before publication. The district points out the yearbook also shows how students are handling the recession, two brothers bonding through their faith, and ways to improve the community. I think everybody's got their um, their opinions, and if they have a problem with it, then they should voice their opinion the same. That is Quita Culpepper reporting. A Canadian bishop caused a stir this week when he said he would not report allegations of sexual abuse to police unless the victim consents. Bishop David Douglas Crosby told media outlets the church always takes its lead from the victim. The statement came the same day Bishop Crosby confirmed he suspended a priest for abuse that reportedly took place in the 80s and 90s. But a spokesman for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police said anyone with knowledge of abuse allegations should come forward because unless police get a complaint, they cannot investigate. Meantime, in Germany, a special investigator says 205 former students claim they were abused sexually and otherwise in Jesuit schools there. The investigator says she believes the number will grow as new allegations are made. 46 ordained and non-clerical staff members at the schools have been accused of abuse. The Jesuits hired the investigator in January after abuse allegations surfaced at a school in Berlin. A Catholic priest in Arizona is leading the charge to get immigration on the ballot there this November. Father John Author is head of the group Compassion for All. He filed papers to get an initiative on the ballot that would allow voters to propose new laws or amend laws already on the books. Reports say Father Author's initiative would repeal many of the provisions of the controversial immigration law signed by the governor last month and place a moratorium on any new immigration legislation in Arizona for three years. And finally, we talk a lot about prayer on this show, but when was the last time you prayed for soccer or football, as it's also affectionately known? Anglicans are doing just that ahead of this year's World Cup, and we get details now from Rome Reports. The Anglican Church has published special prayers for the teams, fans, and hosts of the World Cup in South Africa. Reverend Nick Baines, Bishop of Croydon, has written prayers portraying God as a football player who plays and gives life to the cosmos. 
Reverend Baines says everyone will be affected by the World Cup in one way or another, so it made sense to write prayers suitable to everyone. The prayers ask for sportsmanship and safety during the competition and to bless teams and fans as they celebrate. The bishop has also kept in mind those who are uninterested in the World Cup and will be surrounded by neighbors and friends who are soccer enthusiasts. He wrote a prayer asking to grant them the gift of sympathy if needed. Reverend Baines says the World Cup isn't just about football, but that it is about, quote, the rainbow of nations of the world celebrating together with the people of South Africa. I know many of my international friends, they are passionate about the World Cup. I imagine so. A they, lot of people are. They really <laughs> are. Well, stay tuned. There's much more Currents coming up. Just ahead, his documentary may have you thinking twice about your calling. It takes a lot of courage to follow one's calling at times. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's worthwhile in the end. Welcome back. Well, everybody has a calling, a mission in life, and that is just one message behind director David Rangeli's new documentary called The Calling. It's the story of a religious community taking root in Peru, and it is winning acclaim at film festivals all around the country. That's right. And yesterday, we introduced you to the movie and its director. Tonight, I continue my conversation with David Rangeli as he discusses his inspiration for the film. David, thanks so much for being here again on Currents. We appreciate your time. Thank you for having me back. Well, the film is The Calling that we've been talking about. We yes. talked about it once again uh, in part one of our interview. Now we're here back to talk about a little bit more of your inspiration for the film and, and why make this film about this particular subject and these particular people. The inspiration for the film basically comes from the fact that I am a Catholic. And as a filmmaker, any filmmaker, you want to um, invest your time and your energy into subject matter that you feel very passionate about. There's a lot of rejection one faces when <laughs> making a documentary <laughs> film. Um, so I wanted to make sure that whatever it was I was taking on was something that I wanted to make and that I felt was important to me, but also that I, f I felt may have been underserved on some way. Mm. And delving deeper into the religious journey and into finding out one's path in life, finding the question to some of the fundamental and enduring questions that provide meaning and value to our lives, um, I felt was at that time in my life the thing that I wanted to embrace. Mm -hmm. So this story is a manifestation of that desire on my behalf to try and discover some of the more deeper, deeper and personal aspects of religious life and what it means to us to have that be part of who and what we are. Yeah. And obviously this deals with, you mean, you, you know, you look at just even the title, The Calling. Yeah. It deals with people being called into religious vocations and vocations that we might not be, you know, all that familiar. I mean, you, you obviously you think, when you, when you think about vocations, you think priest, sister, brother, yeah. that sort of thing. But, you know, you don't all the time think of, you know, top of mind, someone going to Peru to minister to the poor. Yeah. But that's part of it as well. Tell me about the, the importance of vocations in this story, the importance of discerning yeah. a call. I think one of the key things that really became present to me as I spent a lot of time with these individuals and sort of to, like a sponge, take in what they were feeling, what they were expressing, and, and, and what they were saying and projecting out into the world was that life is a calling. Mm. That you know, w there, is all, there is something inside all of us that should be open and, and in many ways is open to what that greater calling in our life is. For me as a Catholic, that channel is Christ, my belief, my relationship to my faith. Mm -hmm. That is how I am being informed about the things that I think are important in my life and, and that I want to project out into the world. So in that being a filmmaker and making a film about something like The Calling, there was a, a beautiful blending of those two that came together. Yeah. Um, the film taught me that your actions make a difference. Your beliefs and your actions make a difference in this world. And it, it's wonderful to believe things, but you also need to put those into practice. Right. And that's what these people taught me, that 
it takes a lot of courage to do that, to follow one's calling at times. It's not an easy thing to do at times, but it's worthwhile to do it in the end. Yeah. And your, your website uh, says that you know, the film follows people who, who have the courage to pose a question to themselves, yeah. who am I? Yeah. Do, do we get an answer to that question in this film? I don't think the, qu the answer to the question, who am I, I think is a lifelong asking of that question. And in a day and age where we want everything to be immediate, sometimes that's difficult to ask that question of ourselves because it does you know, bring us to a point of maybe we're not so clear about things. It might raise certain doubts. It might raise certain questions. But I think it's supposed to. You know, we're supposed to engage in this experience and in this quest of discovering, especially through, I believe, you know, practicing one's faith um, as a life lifetime uh, endeavor. Yeah. So the answer to who am I? I don't even know who I am sometimes. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> you know? But I, I, it's a question that's worth asking, and it's a question that I think you know will take us to a place of greater understanding. All right. Well, very good. Now, the film is, of course, The Calling. It's going to be uh, June 3rd and 4th, I believe, Staten Island Film Festival. Will yeah, be June, the June 3rd and 4th, we're going to be at the Staten Island Film Festival, one of numerous festivals where we've been playing at, winning awards at. I'm very happy that the film is being embraced by a more sort of secular audience. And I think it's a testament to these individual stories that while there's a definite religious Catholic component to it, there's also broad universal themes that come across. I mean, to gain the endorsement of someone like a two-time Academy Award winner, Barbara Koppel, mm. I think is a huge vote of confidence of what this film has to say and how it can transcend onto uh, other uh, audiences. Yeah. Well, David, congratulations on all your success. Hope for much more in the future from you. And uh, Thank you. We'll, we'll be looking out for you. I'm sure there are more great things to come. Hopefully, God okay. willing. <laughs> we'll link up to your website uh, and fo where folks can find out more about the film over on our blog as well. So they can head on over to our website and we'll link up to yours. So Thank you. David, thanks so much. Well, you know, they say when you're a writer, they always say, write what you know, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, David has obviously taken that advice and put it into his, uh, his documentary filmmaking because there he said, now my inspiration for this comes from the fact that I'm a Catholic. Mm -hmm. So he said, and I'm very passionate about that. I'm very passionate about my faith. So he put that into the, the making of this film. And I think at least audiences are saying it shows because he's, you know, this story, this very personal story of these people comes through. Right, and it's so nice also to see him doing what he loves and to be, you know, called to have directed this film yeah. and to, you know, to put this piece together. And you really notice that in the lives of others. Some of your friends, I'm sure you'll recognize, do something that they love and others perhaps do not. And right. really some of their daily fulfillment on a regular basis to do what it is that really, you know, makes them happy, I yeah. think is uh, quite inspirational to anyone. It definitely comes through. And the film, of course, as I said, will be at the Staten Island Film Festival next week. It's June 3rd and 4th. I've written much more about it and how you can get your tickets over at our blog. Just go to CurrentsNY.net and click on Riding the Wave. But for now, please stay tuned. There's much more Current straight ahead. When we return, he was a priest and a media giant. A new film looks at the life of Fulton Sheen. Finally tonight, you just heard David Rangeli talking about his documentary about religious life. Well, another film is set to debut next month about a famous religious figure, one who has strong connections to New York City and also to television. That's right. It's Archbishop Fulton Sheen, the legendary broadcaster who blazed a trail through the new medium of television at the time, back in the 1950s. Well, the cause for his canonization is now being investigated. And as we hear from H2O News, a new documentary that was recently screened in Rome gives a glimpse at his life and legacy. The life of Archbishop Fulton John Sheen, known around the world for his use of the television to carry out his apostolate and who won an Emmy Award for Most Outstanding Television Personality in 1952, has recently been turned into a movie called Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, Servant of All. Sheen, a priest from the United States who is considered one of the greatest communicators of the 20th century, hosted a radio program that ran for 20 years. And later, during the 1950s, he was a TV host on the show Life is Worth Living, the Catholic television program that immortalized him. He was known as the John the Baptist of his time, as explained Lisa Wheeler, executive vice president of the Maximus Group, who recently presented this movie in Rome at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas. 
He had an amazing magnetism. Um, he had the ability to um, draw people in with uh, his words and people, you know, in the film, uh, The Servant of All, you'll hear people's testimonies about how he just had an ability to string words together and that the stringing of those words was almost divine. It was almost like he really was using the words of the Holy Spirit, that, that God in some way was using him as a vessel um, to communicate truth. Theology professor and author of 73 books, among which is Life of Christ, published in 1958, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen used all the means of communication to speak to people about God. Fulton Sheen recognized that at, in his time, television was the way to truly live out the gospel and be able to win an Emmy and attract an audience. Shows that he knew how to use that power of the media uh, and he knew that the message that he was sending could possibly reach um, you know, to the four corners of the globe because he understood that the way to reach people is to meet them where they were. Fulton J. Sheen's canonization cause began in 2002. According to Lisa Wheeler, if he is canonized, he will become the first media personality to be raised to the altar. Monsignor Richard Sosman, a canonist from the U.S., spoke to H2O News about the developments in Sheen's canonization process. We finished that work in Peoria in 2008 and sent that all to the congregation for the causes of saints. Now um, it awaits there for the next procedures, next steps, um, which will be the presentation of the Positio by the postulator of the cause, Dr. Andrea Ambosi. We think that will take place, we hope, uh, sometime this fall or winter. And then it, it depends on the causes, uh, the procedures of the, canon, of the um, congregation for the causes of saints. And as we mentioned, that film about Fulton Sheen will be debuting in New York City next month, and we'll be covering that as well. And that is it for tonight. Coming up tomorrow, we end the month of May and the month devoted to Mary with Flores de Mayo. We'll tell you what that is all about. In the meantime, though, remember you can always watch us online. CurrentsNY.net is our website. And check us out on Facebook as well. Just search Currents and you'll find us. Until mm -hmm. next time, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great night.